very good day to you today and blessings to you in the name that is above all names, Jesus Christ, who has redeemed us from our sins and has imputed his righteousness to us so that we can soon stand before him when he gathers in the second and main harvest of the field that will become part of his body. I hope that you are all doing well and that you are as excited as I am to live in the times that we find ourselves in. It is such a blessing to know that our Lord and Savior will soon be returning and to be chosen by Him to share this with those that love Him and who are looking forward with great anticipation to His return. Before I get into today's video, I would like to mention that I've had a comment from a subscriber, and thank you for this, Benita, regarding Daniel 8 verse 26, providing a little more information to us concerning the vision that Gabriel told Daniel would be sealed up with the prophecy until the time of the end. This is what she pointed me to. And the vision of the evening and the morning which was told is true. Wherefore, shut thou up the vision, for it shall be for many days. I find it so amazing that this vision is the same one referred to in Daniel 9 verse 24, where we read the following. Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression and to make an end of sins and to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness and to seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. In Daniel 8 we are told that the vision that would be sealed up has to do with an evening and a morning. In the previous video that I posted, in which we looked at the day and the hour of the Revelation 12 signs fulfillment, we saw that the hour in which the signs fulfillment occurs fits right into the time slot where one day transitions into the next, moving from evening to morning. In other words, the vision truly is of the evening and the morning. When I worked on the previous video, I never even considered Daniel 8 verse 26, and I have found this happening to me a number of times, where the Lord leads me to something and then provides additional information to confirm His word regarding the matter after the fact. I find this absolutely amazing. When we consider how the Lord describes the creation days, we see that each time a day is described, the transition from one day to the next is mentioned by referring to the evening and the morning, as can be seen in an example from a passage in Genesis 1. And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And the evening and the morning were the first day. We also know that God's word teaches us that a day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. But, beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. It is then interesting that the seventh day, or God's day of rest, does not have a description in Genesis like the first six days that each had an evening and a morning associated with them. However, we know that from the time that the very first prophecy was given to Adam and Eve and Satan in the Garden of Eden, there have been roughly 6,000 years that are soon to expire. I find it very characteristic of our God then to use a marker that matches the methodology that he applied right in the beginning to mark the transition from one day to the next, pointing out the evening and the morning in which his day of rest will be initiated. And this is what I believe is exactly what the Revelation 12 sign is showing us. In this case, God marks the evening and the morning where six days or six thousand years of Satan's rule over the kingdoms of the world comes to an end, or the end of his rule over the earth is initiated, and where the final day of God's kingdom being established on earth is also initiated. This is initiated at the point where the evening of one day changes into the morning of a next day. I think this just goes to show that there are so many layers within the Word of God leading to new insight and confirmation of that which is fast approaching and toward which we speed with open eyes, watching for the return of our Lord. In today's video, I will be looking at the parable of the ten virgins given to us in Matthew 25 as the centerpiece of our study. 
I'm once again only offering you my opinion on the matter and what I believe the Lord has revealed to us in these days. Please study this for yourself to ensure that what I say lines up with the Word of God and that you are able to verify my interpretation of Scripture based on Scripture alone and not comparing it with the traditional beliefs and doctrines of men. I hope that you will find this information as exciting and as eye-opening as I have in uncovering it. I also want to thank all my brothers and sisters in Christ who have provided input into this. I really appreciate it. I have long struggled with this parable to reach an understanding that does not in some way contradict other passages in the Word of God, but also touch on aspects that are mentioned in this part of Scripture. I have listened and considered many people's interpretation of this parable, and to an extent I can agree with some of what is said, but there was always something in my spirit that told me to dig deeper, as all the interpretations out there, although they contain some truth, did not capture, in my opinion, an interpretation that is consistent with, with what the rest of the Word of God teaches us. I have prayed about this a lot and I believe that our Heavenly Father has finally given me the most amazing revelation in order to understand this parable correctly. Before I get into this and look at some of the issues that have been troubling me for years, let us see what Jesus conveyed to His disciples through this parable. Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. And five of them were wise, and five were foolish. They that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose, and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said unto the wise, Give us of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. But the wise answered, saying, Not so, lest there be not enough for us and you. But go ye rather to them that sell, and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came. And they that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. Afterward came also the other virgins, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. Watch therefore, for ye know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. There are various aspects that I believe one has to consider when studying this parable. The first aspect to consider is that Jesus sets the stage by saying that the kingdom of heaven is likened unto ten virgins. He does not say that this parable is specifically aimed at Israel or the Gentiles, as many would argue, but that it has to do with the kingdom of heaven and the principles that apply to God's kingdom. When we do a study of instances in which the kingdom of heaven is mentioned, there are many examples of how Jesus and the apostles explain the principles that are associated with his everlasting kingdom, as opposed to Satan's kingdom that is currently in effect in the world. You are welcome to search the scriptures for examples and to see just how many instances there are in which Jesus describes the kingdom of heaven to his listeners, always explaining the principles that are associated with his kingdom. We also know that Paul says in Romans 2, that in the current dispensation there is no distinction between Jews and Gentiles. And as such, when we read about the kingdom of God and those who will enter into it, there is currently no difference between the two and the salvation that Jesus made available to the entire world on the cross is available to any person who would accept it through faith in Jesus Christ. Tribulation and anguish upon every soul of man that doeth evil, of the Jew first, and also of the Gentile. But glory, honor, and peace to every man that worketh good, to the Jew first, and also to the Gentile. For there is no respect of persons with God. Does this mean that God does not have a specific purpose for the nation of Israel after the church age comes to an end? I believe the Bible clearly shows us that God has a very specific purpose for Israel as a nation by firstly having them recognize who their true Messiah is during Jacob's trouble 
and having prepared the new earth for them to repopulate during the millennium. I believe God's word clearly shows us that Israel is God's wheat harvest, as discussed in part 2 of the rapture series, and that the millennium is specifically intended for them, even though tares will be sown into this field by the enemy during Jacob's trouble. We will look at this in more detail in an upcoming video where I plan to provide my understanding of what happens during the final half of the seven year period which is referred to as the tribulation. I have heard many say that when Jesus spoke in Matthew 24, the information provided was only intended for the Jews. But does this provide us with a solid foundation to build our understanding on? This viewpoint directly contradicts two passages in my opinion. Then said I, Lo, I come. In the volume of the book it is written of me, I delight to do thy will, O my God. Yea, thy law is within my heart. All scripture is given by inspiration of God, and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. I believe that in the light of what is written in these two passages, that it is unwise to treat certain sections of the Word of God as only intended for specific people or groups based on the timing of when certain statements were made. Not that such an interpretation is not valid and applicable, but if we exclude all understanding that God has provided to us in His Word, claiming it was only meant for a specific group, we also remove all the other layers of understanding that God has hidden for us in His Word. We could take a similar approach to the book of Daniel. It was specifically given to Daniel and concerns the nation of Israel. However, we know today that only the Gentiles are given a complete understanding of the information contained therein. Just as the wise men in the days of Jesus' birth knew when Israel's Messiah would be born, while Israel did not. These passages clearly show us that we should consider all the information provided to us in this supernatural book, and I believe this is also how the Holy Spirit inspired the writers of the Bible so that everything that was written needs to be considered to obtain a correct understanding. My conclusion that I draw then from the first aspect that Jesus describes in this parable is that the ten virgins do not specifically represent either the Jews or the Gentiles, but those who belong to or form part of the kingdom of God, having accepted Jesus' free gift of eternal life which he offers to any person who would accept it through faith in Jesus Christ. He laid down his righteous life and was made sin for us so that we could be made the righteousness of God in the eyes of the Father, irrespective of whether we are Jew or Gentile. Hearken, my beloved brethren, hath not God chosen the poor of this world rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he hath promised to them that love him? But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe. For there is no difference, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. The next aspect that Jesus focuses on is the difference between the virgins. Five of them are said to be wise, while the other five are said to be foolish. And this then specifically has to do with the oil in their lamps. This is an aspect that I have struggled with for a long time, given the many interpretations out there of what the oil represents. And in this video I will touch on two of the major viewpoints of what I believe the oil does not represent, and in the next video I will focus on what I believe it does represent. Some say that the oil represents the Holy Spirit in us. This could be plausible to some degree, but why does the lack of oil in the foolish virgin's lamps only become an issue when the announcement of the return of the bridegroom is made? Before this point, it would seem that the wise and the foolish virgins were all in the same state or situation, asleep and not requiring the use of their lamps. 
This fact alone had me scratching my head, wondering why the Holy Spirit, if this is what the oil represented, would not be required up to the point where the arrival of the bridegroom was announced. The oil would, therefore, in my opinion, seem to have a different meaning. Also, it would seem that the foolish virgins had oil at some point, but that this was not sufficient stating that their lamps have gone out. So at some point prior to the arrival of the bridegroom they did have burning lamps. The question we need to answer then is this, if a person has received the Holy Spirit and their spirit has become one with the Holy Spirit, is there any evidence from the Word of God that would show different measures of the Holy Spirit in people or partial transformations by the Holy Spirit of a person becoming born again? Please consider the following passages. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away, behold, all things are become new. But he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power. Let your conversation be without covetousness, and be content with such things as ye have. For he hath said, I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee. When we study the detail provided in these passages, I think you will agree with me that viewing the Holy Spirit as being represented by the oil in the Virgin's lamps causes some contradiction with what is written in these statements. There is no partiality in the work that the Holy Spirit performs when a person is born again and becomes part of the kingdom of God as a new creation. When a person is saved, the Holy Spirit does all the work and this work is completed perfectly. There remains no unfinished work except for the corruptible body that requires replacement, and we know that this forms part of the first resurrection, and that this process is modeled after the three separate harvest portions explained to us in the Word. I cannot find support from the Word of God for some people having more of God's Spirit than others, or having received a larger portion of salvation than others when they were born again. A person is either saved completely, or they remain lost. There is no in-between situation. A person either has their spirit joined to the Holy Spirit after being born again, or they remain dead in their sins, and once a person has become a new creation, there is no reversal of this process. And now I am no more in the world, but these are in the world, and I come to thee. Holy Father, keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in thy name. Those that thou gavest me I have kept, and none of them is lost but the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. However, when we consider the harvest pattern of Israel, we see this differentiation once again between the main harvest, which would, in my opinion, be associated with the wise virgins, and the corners of the field that are left to the poor, representing the foolish virgins, and we need to discover what the differentiating factors are. Another viewpoint that I often encounter is that the oil represents the righteous works of those who have faith, as faith without works is dead. Some also say that only those who go back to keeping Torah after they have been saved will be accounted wise and worthy to enter into the marriage of the bridegroom. This is another viewpoint that gives me no peace when I consider what many passages in the Word of God say. Let us look at some. But we are all as an unclean thing, and all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags, and we all do fade as a leaf and our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. For as many as are under the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, Cursed is every one that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. For whosoever shall keep the whole law, and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. 
Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped, and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore by the deeds of the law there shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested being witnessed by the law and the prophets, wherefore the law was our schoolmaster, to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. But after that faith is come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. There are several other passages that could be added to these, supporting the fact that we are not able to keep the law of God according to the requirements set out by Him. If we then put ourselves back under the law after we have been saved, all we do is to put ourselves back under the curse that the law proclaims over those that fail at any point of the law. Paul makes it clear that no flesh is justified before God by the deeds of the law. So to say that the additional oil in the lamps of the wise virgins are their good works or their ability to keep the law of God is contradicting all of these passages. I would tend to lean towards an opposite understanding in this regard that those who think that they are able to earn respect before God by trying to keep the law of the Torah are in fact deceived and they want to purchase something in the place of something far more precious that God has already given them freely. It would also imply a measure of boasting on their behalf, believing that through their works they become more deserving of God's grace and that they deserve a greater position in the kingdom of God because of what they have done instead of giving Jesus the honor for what he has done on their behalf. They often believe that they are able to add to what Jesus perfected, relying on their own achievements, which are specifically excluded according to the word. To declare, I say, at this time his righteousness, that he might be just, and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. Where is boasting then? It is excluded. By what law? Of works? Nay, but by the law of faith. Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. I am of the opinion that people who rely on their own achievements and efforts to earn favor with God are in fact throwing dirty rags over their clean garments that Jesus provided for us freely, spoiling something that was perfect to start off with. We see this hinted at in Revelation 7. And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest... And he said to me, These are they which came out of great tribulation, and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. The Bible declares that Jesus imputed his righteousness to us, and became sin for us, so that we can become God's righteousness. For he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Would Jesus give us dirty robes that need washing when we are made the righteousness of God? We also see that this righteousness is described as the garments that are worn by the bride in Revelation 19. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. And he saith unto me, Write, Blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, These are the true sayings of God. It is then interesting to know that those who come through great tribulation have to wash their robes, which at one point were perfectly clean. And this is confirmed for us in the following passage. For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein and overcome, the latter end is worse with them than the beginning. For it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after they have known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. But it has happened unto them according to the true proverb, The dog is turned to his own vomit again, 
and the sow that was washed to her wallowing in the mire. What then is the holy commandment that Peter is referring to in this passage? Is it keeping the law after we have come to the knowledge of our Lord and Savior? Jesus explains clearly to us that he received a commandment from the Father and that his commandment is everlasting life. For I have not spoken of myself, but the Father which sent me, he gave me a commandment what I should say and what I should speak. And I know that his commandment is life everlasting. Whatsoever I speak therefore, even as the Father said unto me, so I speak. Which commandment then leads to life everlasting? Jesus provides us with two verses clearly spelling out what the commandment is that were given to him to give to us that leads to everlasting life. And this is the will of him that sent me, that every one which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me hath everlasting life. We also see that many will come to Jesus believing that they have met all the requirements, and find that the door is closed on them, as we read in Matthew 7. Not every one that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works? And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. The situation lines up with the situation the foolish virgins found themselves in when the bridegroom told them that he did not know them after the door to the marriage had been shut and they found themselves outside. What are these people focusing on? I believe that these have focused and relied on their own works and effort instead of focusing on and believing in Jesus only, as instructed, not adding to what he has done. If anybody doubts that this is indeed the commandment that Jesus received from the Father, we can approach this from another angle. In Revelation 2 and 3, each of the seven churches is promised a specific reward by Jesus if they overcame the world. Given the importance of this discussion, and that these rewards are intended for the body of Christ, I think you would agree that it is very important to fully understand what it means to overcome the world. Here are two of the seven instances where Jesus made these promises to the seven churches. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. He that overcometh the same shall be clothed in white raiment, and I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. It is interesting to see that a person who overcomes the world will receive a white garment that is clean, and this garment does not require further cleansing in the blood of the Lamb. Jesus' work on the cross provides a clean garment to every person who would accept it as he was made sin for us so that we could become the righteousness of God through what he has done. It has nothing to do with anything that we can do. For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. We see then that this righteousness that Jesus imputes to us is described as the clothing of the bride that has become the wife of the bridegroom, who is Jesus. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife hath made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. And he saith unto me, Write, Blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, These are the true sayings of God. 
How is the bride that will be married to the bridegroom prepared for this glorious event according to the word of God? What information does the word of God provide regarding her cleansing and who is responsible for this? Husbands, love your wives even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with a washing of water by the word that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. The bride is cleansed to perfection by the bridegroom, and he presents the bride as perfectly clean to himself. The garments with which she is arrayed are received from the bridegroom and has nothing to do with her own efforts. So many people argue that Jesus will not accept a bride if she is not spotless at his return, and that people should focus on becoming spotless before he returns. I think it is clear to see from Ephesians 5 that it is not possible for the bride to clean herself. Why would we need salvation if it was possible for us to clean ourselves? Only Jesus can wash our sins away and we obtain salvation not through our own efforts but only through belief in Jesus Christ. We also see that those without wedding garments will not be allowed to enter the wedding. And when the king came in to see the guests, he saw there a man which had not on a wedding garment. And he saith unto him, Friend, how camest thou in hither not having a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then said the king to the servants, Bind him hand and foot, and take him away, and cast him into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. We could then ask why those who come out of great tribulation had to wash their garments in the blood of the Lamb. It would imply that they either did not have wedding garments to start off with, or that their garments, which were once clean, were no longer spotless, even though they formed part of those who had obtained salvation through faith in Jesus. Something happened that caused their garments to be soiled, requiring cleansing in the blood of the Lamb again. So the very important question we have to answer is, what does it mean to overcome the world and to receive a clean garment from the Lord? If we rely on people's opinions about this, we will probably get a number of varying answers. So as always, our source of information should always be the Word of God to give the final verdict on this, and we find it in 1 John 5. For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world, and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Who is he that overcometh the world, but he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God? I believe that when we understand how the harvests of God are made up, and that we have two groups present at the point where our Redeemer returns, we begin to see how specific qualities are associated with these groups as we encounter them and the models associated with them in the Word of God. Those who are represented by the wise virgins have different qualities than those who are foolish. Even though both groups have been sanctified by the first fruits, there are different qualities that are associated with them. Can we then say that we are overcoming the world when we believe in Jesus? And, in addition to our faith, we also try to keep the law if we keep to what the Bible says. I believe the word shows us the exact opposite. If we try to add anything to the perfectly completed work of Jesus, especially when we ignore what the word says about people who fail at a single point of the law, all that we do is to soil our clean garments that consist of Jesus' righteousness alone. It is so easy to believe that we are earning favor with God when we convince ourselves that the curse pronounced over those who put themselves back under the law does not apply to someone who is saved. Instead of repenting from this foolishness, people boast about how they keep the law or parts of it, not realizing that they are walking around soiling their garments and believing that what Jesus did was not sufficient and that their efforts will award them additional accolades. These become proud of what they think they are achieving instead of realizing how their beliefs are contradicting the word of God 
while they are strengthening sin in their lives, never considering repenting from their foolishness and of the sin that they are strengthening in their lives by trying to keep the law. When we consider the principles of the kingdoms of this world, we know that everything is based on people's efforts or their works. Every religion in this world requires their followers to earn a position based on dedicated effort and performance from their side. They have to do something in order to become or earn something. Only in Christianity is everything done on our behalf, and we only have to believe and accept this most precious gift through faith in Jesus Christ. It means that we have to put all our trust in Him alone. If after we have been born again, we go back to following the worldly system of works, can we truly say that we have overcome the world? So what about the passage in James saying faith without works is dead? For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. We have to consider the example and the context that James gives to his readers to clarify what this means. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar? Seest thou how faith wrought with his works, and by works was faith made perfect? What does this example tell us? It is clear that Abraham acted out his faith in the works that he performed according to what he believed. He did not look for a backup plan to provide him with options and alternatives, but he acted out what he believed in his heart. If we believe our Heavenly Father when He says that we overcome the world only when we have faith in Jesus as our Savior, and we do not act on this faith by doing only what God says we should do to overcome the world, can we really call it faith made perfect? If after we have knowledge of God's grace towards us, and we begin to rely again on our own righteousness, which is described as filthy rags, is our faith not dead or tainted with sin when we try to return the favor to God? I believe the works that James described in this passage clearly points to our ability to give ourselves over to trusting the Lord's promises completely, just as Abraham kept the promise that God gave him and Sarah before Isaac was even conceived. And God said, Sarah thy wife shall bear thee a son indeed, and thou shalt call his name Isaac, and I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant and with his seed after him. When God promises you something and you believe him completely and act accordingly, no matter the circumstances, this is what I believe is referred to as the works that are associated with faith and has nothing to do with going back to keeping the law. Abraham knew that God made him a promise when he announced Isaac's birth to him and Sarah, and even if Abraham killed Isaac, that God would not break his promise in which an everlasting covenant had already been pronounced involving Isaac. Works that are associated with faith has nothing to do with keeping the law. In fact, I believe that trying to keep the law once a person has been saved demonstrates that person's lack of faith in Jesus' ability to cleanse them from their sins. Now I have heard many quote the following passage to prove their argument for keeping the law. For verily I say unto you, Till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law, till all be fulfilled. Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments, and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say unto you that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. When we read this passage, it would seem that Jesus' desire is for us to keep all of the law and not to break one of the commandments. However, we have to bring the rest of Scripture into consideration when setting out to obtain understanding of what Jesus is saying here. Firstly, we have to consider the following. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, 
they are all gone aside. They are all together become filthy. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. Bringing these two passages into view when we consider Matthew 5 verse 18 to 20, we begin to understand that when Jesus refers to anyone who breaks one of the least commandments and teach others to do so, he is referring to everyone on earth who tries to keep the law and teach others to do so. The Bible clearly shows us that a curse is pronounced over every person who is under the law and fails at any point. We also know that there is no person except Jesus who could keep the law perfectly. For as many as are under the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, Cursed is every one that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. So how is it then possible for someone to conform to what Jesus mentions next, and that is to do the commandments and to teach them? The Bible clearly shows us that if we keep Jesus' commandment, which is also a commandment that he received from his Father and a commandment that leads to everlasting life, that we can only exceed the righteousness of the scribes and enter the kingdom of God by having faith in Jesus, and to teach others to do so as well. For I have not spoken of myself, but the Father which sent me, he gave me a commandment what I should say and what I should speak. And I know that his commandment is life everlasting. Whatsoever I speak therefore, even as the Father said unto me, so I speak. And this is the will of him that sent me, that every one which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me hath everlasting life. Coming back to the parable of the ten virgins, Something else that is very important to note is that there is absolutely no detectable difference between the wise and the foolish virgins while the bridegroom tarried. All of them fell asleep not requiring the use of their lamps or oil for that matter until the announcement of the arrival of the bridegroom was made. Only at this point does the difference between the wise and the foolish become evident. The foolish virgins attempted to obtain oil from the wise and then departed to buy additional oil and were not found ready when the bridegroom arrived. We often miss the fact that there is a gap in time or an interval between the announcement of the bridegroom's arrival being made and the time when he actually arrived. And it is during this time period that the wise virgins are differentiated from the foolish. Jesus tells us that the door to the marriage is shut behind the wise after they entered into the marriage with the bridegroom, and that the foolish tried to get into the marriage after the door was shut, but were told by the bridegroom that he did not know them. So what do we make of this, given that the traditional understanding of what the oil represents does not provide a perfectly solid explanation that avoids contradiction with several other passages in the Word of God? My desire was for our Heavenly Father to reveal this to me so that the understanding makes perfect sense, without any contradictions. In the next video I will look at this with you and show you how the Word of God interprets this for us and allows us understanding of the mystery that God has given to those who long for His return and who love His appearing. Thank you so much for watching this video. If you enjoyed the information provided, Please give the video a like and subscribe and share it with your friends and family. I hope to have the next video out soon and look forward to sharing with you the meaning of the oil in the lamps of the virgins and how it relates to the time that we live in. Until next time, God bless.